Welcome guys to this fourth and the final part of the video series of discussion of hemolytic anemia. In this video, we are going to discuss about paroxysm and nocturnal hemoglobinuria. Now, I myself wanted to discuss this part separately from other of the topics. One, because it is a very important one for the exam as well as for understanding point of view. Second, it has slightly different pathophysiology, clinical feature and management lines compared to the other hemolytic anemia. And there should not be information overload which hampers understanding of this topic. Okay. So, coming to this paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, first thing that should be always kept in mind that it is nothing but a misnomer, right? So, it is not paroxysmal actually, it is but rather acute on chronic variety of disease. Then, it is not only nocturnal. Uh, but rather something which aggravates due to lot of factor among which night time is one of the aggravator other being stress or stasis or infection even physiological stressful condition like pregnancy can aggravate this condition and and it is not only hemoglobinuria but rather pancytopenia which is more common presentation so it is not paroxysmal acute and chronic disease it is not nocturnal it is almost due to stasis pattern and it is not per se hemoglobinuria as a presentation not only hemoglobin it is pancytopenia usual presentation even aplastic anemia pnh overlap can be the presentation also therefore this is a misnomer for the disease identification all right so what does this PNH stands in the spectrum of hemolytic anemia and what does it fit into? We have revisited this chart, this table, Harrison table again and again. From here you can see PNH is acute disease and with defect lying at the level of the RBC itself also known as the intercorpuscular defect. So this is a acute intercorpuscular defect. Here the defect lies at the level of gene known as known as pig a gene all right so defect light at this pig a gene now what does it do what does it do now if you consider some part of it for example let us consider this to be the pig a gene its function is to produce anchoring protein for RBC membrane when the one which it mainly produces one which it mainly produces a lot of GPI anchor for the RBC membrane and for us the concerning GPI anchor protein through which proteins are bound are mainly to mainly to by the name of CD55 CD55 and CD59 CD55 is also known as decay acceleration factor or 3T convertase inhibitor and CD59, CD59, CD55 is decay acceleration factor or 3T convertase inhibitor and CD59 is membrane inhibitor of reactive lysine, membrane inhibitor of reactive lysine. Now here there is requirement of need to understand the complement cascade pathway remember complement continuously circulate in the body and and this circulating complement main function is to lyse and identify cells cells which are main for only for phagocytosis it can lyse foreign cell it can lyse self cell also now in self cell there should be some component which help us to identify which help us to identify whether the complement should lies or not. One of those factor for RBC membrane is CD55 and CD59. So, CD55 and 59 act as a checkpoint for the complement to prevent them to lyse the RBC membrane. Now, if there is defect at this checkpoint level, there will be lysis of RBC resulting into hemolytic anemia and this PNH, paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria or this hemolytic anemia variety. Now, if you know uh, for the complement pathway mainly the two type i am going to discuss that is the classic pathway and the alternate pathway 
Now classic mainly starts with the antigen antibody interaction. This antigen antibody complex activates the C1Q. C1Q activates C4C2. C4C2 gets converted to C3 in the presence of C3 convertase. C3 convertase and from C3, C3B is formed which cleavage of C3D. C3D is also a strong opsinin which helps to identify the cell and gets sliced in the splenic macrophages. Now C3B, from C3B there is formation of C5 to C9 which is nothing but nothing but membrane attack complex and membrane attack complex and this results into lysis okay this results into lysis now in alternate pathway in alternate pathway it starts mainly with mainly with factor b mainly with factor b factor b from to c3 and here here C3 convertase, uh, C3 convertase is nothing but C3B, BV, which is nothing but act as a C3 convertase and rest of the chart follows like similar pattern. So, so CD59 inhibits this step membrane attack complex. So, CD59 inhibits this step and C3 convertase is inhibited by mainly by CD55. So remember, you can remember as CD59 is 59 and C5 to C9 is the membrane type complex and CD55 has two letters, same letter 5 and 5 and C3 convert is nothing but C3BB and it is also has C3BB, it is also at the same letter in it. So 55BB and 59 and 59, all right. So you can remember this way. Now, now, here what happens is there is defect at the level of CD55 or CD59, CD55 which is decay acceleration fraction or CD59 which is membrane inhibitor of reactive lysine resulting into an inability of the complement to identify the RBC membrane and lysis of RBC. Lysis of RBC. This is the basic this is the basic pathogenesis behind the disease process of paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. Okay. So, you can check here again. We have visited this RBC membrane chart a lot of times. So, you can see this is the CD59 moiety which is associated with this transmembrane protein. Transmembrane protein is GPA which is synthesized by nothing but pig A gel. GPA or glucose phosphatidyl N-acetyl. Okay. Phosphatidyl inositol glycosyl A gene, pig A gene, helps in produce of GPA, which is a transmembrane protein through which CD59 moiety or the protein is attached. Okay. Now, from here, from here, let's move into the symptom of symptom of PNH. Now, PNH can be remembered with a triad. It can be remembered with a triad mainly mainly triad of hemolysis, thrombosis, thrombosis and pancytopenia. This is the classic triad of symptomic presentation. Now hemolysis, hemolysis is mainly in PNH is persistent intravascular, persistent intravascular. hemolysis sometimes it is associated with extravascular hemolysis plus minus extravascular hemolysis and on and off on and off there is exacerbation due to stress stress can be nighttime effect stress can be stasis stress can be pregnancy stress can be infection now there is thrombosis thrombosis mainly arterial Mainly venous, venous is the more common, but it can be also arterial, arterial or venous. Remember, thrombosis is the most common cause of death. All right, okay. Then there can be pancytopenia as well as in the presentation of clinical symptoms, right? Okay. Now, 
if we check the symptom wise distribution symptom wise distribution according to percentage most common symptom is 80 percent cases is fatigue in 64 percent cases it's dyspnea in 62 percent case is hemoglobinuria and in 16 percent cases thrombosis so from this percentage wise distribution it can be easily identified that hemoglobinuria which is in the name is not the most common symptom but fatigue is the most common symptom and thrombosis all the very rare all the very rare but is the most common cause of death cause of death okay and this thrombosis is sometime on evolution evolution is found to be be a pnh case all right okay so how did this thrombosis present thrombosis can present as one recurrent abdominal pain a recurrent abdominal pain mainly due to the thrombosis of abdominal veins and there can be presentation of ascites ascites in normal almost near to normal liver function test and no other causes of ascites which is found with high sag high sag ascites and which on evolution found to have found to have nothing but that is hepatic vein thrombosis which is also known as but cherry syndrome but cherry syndrome which presents at acute hematomegaly with ascites there can be also presentation of erectile dysfunction or dysphagia with due to the thrombosis part all right okay so so here again uh, there is high sac ascites in but cherry syndrome okay so this is the clinical presentation of this disease per se so what are the clinical presentation it can be it can be with the triad you can remember of hemolysis hemolysis mainly intravascular hemolysis plus one minus extravascular and along with exacerbation on and off thrombosis mainly arterial or venous but um, thrombosis is the most common cause of death or pancytopenia as presentation pancytopenia there is anemia thrombocytopenia and low, low tlc count anemia anemia can present with anemia can present with the most common feature that is the fatigue okay then almost fatigue followed by dyspnea and hemoglobinuria and thrombosis so hemoglobinuria is the is not the most common presentation fatigue is most common presentation followed by dyspnea hemoglobinuria is the rather than third most common presentation and 16 percent cases presented thrombosis but it is the most common cause of death now once you know once you know about this disease symptoms disease pathophysiology now how do you diagnose it so diagnosis diagnosis of paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria involves a test known as m test it is nothing but flow cytometry or flare involving identification of cd55 and cd59 this is a definitive diagnosis and to assess the level of CD55 and CD59, usually granulocyte cell are taken, although RBC cell can be taken. Now, if there is more than 5% in RBC, more than 5% deficiency in CD55 and CD59, or more than 20% in granulocyte deficiency of CD55 or CD59, it is considered to be a diagnostic value. Okay. So, yeah, you can see this is the flow cytometer tube. Flow cytometer tube. Now, what is used? What is the principle used here? Principle used here is to check the how much percentage of active normal cell present or not. Now, you can see this is the S of CD55 and CD59 with the help of the FLIR technique. Now, you can see in 99% cases in this person's granulocytes. 99% cases CD55 and CD59 was present. So, 99% case cells has this CD55 and CD59 present. Therefore, this is a normal one. Whereas here, you can see only 12% had CD55 and CD59 and in 85% cases CD55 and CD59 was absent. Therefore, it is nothing but a case of paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. Remember, if this CD55 and CD59 is less than 10%, it can be aplastic anemia. 10 to 
can be aplastic anemia and PNH overlap and more than 40% is nothing but a classic PNH. Therefore, this is a case of classic PNH. Okay. So, there is an important mnemonic to identify the proximal nocturnal hemoglobin part. For the P, you can remember it, it is due to pig A gene mutation. From H, you can remember the HEM test. M test is nothing but detection of CD55 and CD59 with flare technique. And from N, you can remember the nighttime symptom. Now, why there is nighttime symptom? There are multiple theories which has been proposed, but which one is believed morely is rather the in nighttime there is decrease in oxygen supply to the tissue level, resulting in slight increase in PSO2 level. This slight increase in PSO2 result in a condition of increased activation of the complement and as there is more circulating complement present in the body plus there is decrease in the RBC's capability to defend itself from the complement activated so there is increase in lysis increase in lysis intravascular hemolysis and resulting into cola colored urine in the early morning early morning okay so from here let's come into the treatment part so how do you treat this patient so treatment is usually can be divided into three part treatment can be divided into three part first part is a supportive treatment for supportive what you need to give we need to give iron folate plus minus red blood cell transfusion and if there is thrombosis as a presentation obviously we need to anticoagulate the patient okay now specific treatment or definitive treatment is mainly can be through pharmacotherapy by a drug drug known as eculizumab what does eculizumab does Eculizumab reduces the intravascular hemolysis by inhibiting the terminal component, terminal component C5 to C9. Now, as you seen in the main pathophysiology, C5 to C9 is the membrane attack complex, which has strong association with the CD59 moiety. So, eculizumab inhibits the C5 to C9 and, and helps in lysis of the RBC. Now, if C5 to C9 is inhibited by eculizumab, so membrane attack complex is inhibited in this patient already. So, they have high risks of Neisseria, meningitis or capsulated organism infection. Therefore, prior to start of eculizumab, it is mandatory to have Neisseria meningitis vaccination. Okay, vaccination again Neisseria meningitis. Now, if this therapy fails, this therapy fails, then next step obviously is allogenic hematopoietic stem cell transfer okay so that's all about paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria this is a short topic okay so in the next module we will cover the other topics from the hematology parts